Good evening, everybody. Welcome. Can you hear me okay? Okay, good. Um, my name's Jane Compson. I'm a member of the faculty here in the Interdisciplinary Arts and Sciences School. It's my great pleasure um, to welcome again Dr. Barry Curzon to Tacoma. He is, um, some of you have already met him, I know, but he is um, a former assistant professor at the UW School of Medicine. He's a Buddhist monk. He is physician to the Dalai Lama, and he is founder and executive director of the Altruism in Medicine Institute. And he is now a visiting scholar at UWT, which we're very excited about. Dr. Curzon spends about seven months annually teaching around the world in countries including India, Japan, Malaysia, Mongolia, North America, Europe, Ukraine, and Russia. Hong Kong. And Hong Kong. Oh, yes. <laughs> Hong Kong. He continues practicing medicine, treating poor people as well as the highest Tibetan lamas free of charge. And I believe you're certified in California still, too. He is a board certified as he's a board certified fellow in the American Board of Family Medicine and is a diplomate in the American Academy of Family Physicians. I hope you'll give him a warm welcome and our gratitude to you for being here, Dr. Curzon. Well, it's lovely to be back in the Northwest, to be back in Tacoma. Uh, as some of you know, I've given a few talks here in the last couple years. And as Dr. Compson Jane mentioned, uh, I spent about almost four years in Seattle. So this isn't really home, but it's quite familiar. It's you know kind of close to home. Um, tonight, we're going to talk about chaos. And uh, I think you can all relate to that. I think many of us feel that our world is chaotic. And so the talk is going to be, how do we balance? Uh, how do we maintain balance amid chaos? That's going to kind of be the talk tonight. And as I mentioned earlier, um, you know, we have the room until 8, but I don't think we're going to go that long. It's past my bedtime, so. <laughs> but we can if we want or need. Uh, I was thinking roughly till 7.30, you know, just to give you a ballpark. If I'm a little shy or a little over, you know, but roughly 7, I'm aiming for 7.30. Um, and there'll be three activities. One is me talking, you know, blah, blah, blah. I'm good at blah, blah, blah. And number two is going to be uh, a discussion group, a discussion session. So I will open it up, and you're welcome to make comments. You're, wel you're welcome to ask questions. And we'll ask people to line up behind the two mics in the, uh, in the, on the side aisles, please, for that. And then, as I mentioned before, if we're not asleep, particularly if I'm not asleep, <laughs> then we'll do meditation together. So that's the plan. So maintaining balance among chaos. amid chaos. Anybody feeling blocked? It's a rhetorical question. Anybody feeling blocked? I think we all are feeling blocked. <laughs> Albert Einstein said, I fear the day that technology will surpass our human interaction. The world will have a generation of idiots. <laughs> Albert Einstein. OK, we often, some of you have seen this slide now. I've, I've used it in one of our classes. Um, and I think I used it out on Vashon Island. Did I use this slide? I think so. Um, we often walk up to people and we say, hi, how are you? And most of the time, what we do is we kind of put a smile on our face and say, I'm good. Or maybe we say, I'm fine. If we come from Britain, we say, I'm fine. Um, and yet, we may not be. In fact, probably we're not. So what might we be feeling as we smile and say, I'm fine? We might be feeling confused, betrayed, 
useless, broken, never good enough, fragile, anxious, falling apart and you don't even recognize, pathetic, annoying, rejected, lonely, defeated. So these are kind of some of the emotions, attitudes, and ways of you know, living that are part of our modern life. And I want to clue you into a secret. It's not just in Tacoma. It's also in Seattle. <laughs> <laughs> and everywhere in the world that I go to anyway, you know, where there's modern, busy lifestyle. And that's pretty much everywhere, OK? Particularly in the big cities. OK, anybody relate to this slide? How about that one? Or you feel like you're just cracking, you're falling apart. Sometimes we go through a period in our life when we kind of hit a wall and we just, you know, like it's almost cracking and falling into pieces. This is not uncommon. Some of you may be going through that or can really relate to that right now. OK, I'll read it. You can read with me. Locked within the walls of my own mind, unable to escape, reaching out for help that's not there. My demons are inside. No one can save me from myself. So tired of flailing and struggling to no avail. Exhausted, worn down, every fiber of my being screaming, let me out. Now, you may be going through something like this right now. You also may know somebody who's going through this right now or suspect they might be. If that's the case, please help, get help, reach out. Very, very important. Don't let that slip by, OK? This is a quote from F. Scott Fitzgerald. The loneliest moment in someone's life is when they are watching their whole world fall apart, and all that they can do is stare blankly. Almost feel like, you know, in a glass jar, withdrawn, isolated, nobody there to help. Sometimes we feel this way. Or it's just too much. I had the TV on last night. Too much. I got to put my head in the sand, block it out. Sometimes we feel that way. I didn't have the TV on last night because I was with some friends that don't have a TV. But I did watch the first debate. I was in Japan on my way to the United States, coming from India, had one day layover. It turns out that the debate was, the first debate was on. And where I was staying, there was a, no, there wasn't a TV. We watched it on the internet. Yeah. What's happening to our country? OK. Fear is a major, major factor these days. And I'm not going to read through all that. I don't know if you can see it. I guess you can see it. Things like discrimination, infidelity, AIDS, privacy, China, immigration, divorce, economy, suicide. Terrorism, abortion, cancer, layoffs, loneliness, finances, snakes, Islam, rejection, flying loss, cats, helplessness, grades, lies, death, retirement, getting caught, parenting, failure, pollution, temper, unemployed, sudden infant death syndrome, SIDS, 401k, clowns, hackers, spiders, defeat, illness, savings, and then a few in the question mark. So I've put at the bottom, violence, not listening, and politics. We seem to be overwhelmed and actually getting numb to some of these things because we're so overwhelmed. And I spend a lot of time, most of my time is not in the United States. It's in other countries, as Jane mentioned. And looking from those other countries, that's what people often see these days about America, is, you know, well, politics is weird in a lot of countries, so they may not see it as so weird. 
but the amount of violence that happens and the amount of not listening to people, people to people, in our Congress and you name it, um, is something that's drawing the attention of people around the world, at least those that I meet and talk to. You're not alone. So this is the real important key here. When you feel or you have a loved one or a friend or an acquaintance that's going through that withdrawal and feeling that the life is cracking or feeling that um, uh, you know, things are just falling apart, um, they probably are feeling, or, or if you're going through it, feeling very isolated, very alone. But you're not alone. We're all so much interconnected and so many of those interconnections we don't recognize. So because of that, it's very important to reach out to others who may be in trouble and to offer help, even get professional help. There's a wave of suicides going on. Uh, in, so I teach usually for a couple months in the beginning of the year, January, February, March, uh, in Hong Kong, at Hong Kong Uni University of Hong Kong. And when I was there earlier this year, there was a wave of suicides among, uh, among uh, uh, students, all ages, kindergarten to graduate school, postgraduate work. And we had not finished the academic year. And the numbers were three times the previous year. That's in Hong Kong. And Hong Kong is not isolated. This is happening for a long time in Japan, Scandinavian countries. Uh, we hear that this is happening in the big cities in China. We don't have good data. I haven't seen it. But it's also it's happening everywhere. Happening in America. It's happening in Europe. Um, it, it's almost an ec epidemic proportions. Um, I've had people close to me in the last 20, 12 months die of suicide. A mentor died of suicide. Uh, a dear, my sister's best friend from when they were I think in kindergarten or grade school anyway, um, her second child was named after my sister. He committed suicide within this year. I have a lot of people coming up to me asking me. They have friends, family members, children, and parents that have committed suicide. What, what do we do? It, it's out there a lot. You may or may not have it close to you, but it's there. And you know, please have your you know, like in Mork and Mindy, you know, dee, 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 dee. You remember that stuff? <laughs> Those antenna? You guys are too, too young, I think. You know, uh, have your antenna up, OK? If you or someone else is, seems to be in some trouble, please do reach out and help, and professional help if, if you think that's appropriate. So we all have negative emotions. That's the negative side. And the positive side, we have the opportunity to work with those negative emotions and slowly turn them to make them positive. Okay? You know, without the negative emotions, from one perspective, life would be boring, nothing to do. So the fact that we have negativity gives us that opportunity to work on them. And that's true of all of us. I don't think anybody here is excluded from that. And probably nobody, maybe a couple, from the five point, I mean 7.2 or 3 billion people walking the earth. Because that's part of being human, to have negative stuff. We all have it. Okay. So it gives us the opportunity to work on it. That's the, that's the really wonderful side of having negative thoughts, emotions, attitudes. Rage. So let's churn the milk of anger and transform it into the butter of patience and compassion. Anybody here churn milk to get butter? Have you ever done that? Some of you are right, you're shaking your heads. Yeah, great. So I have a question for you, those of you that have experience. When you've finished your churning of the milk or the cream, and you take off the, you know, the thing that you're churning with, take it out, and you look inside, what do you have there? Butter. Do you have any milk or cream? Huh? You do? When you fully churned it? You don't. 
you haven't fully churned it. When you fully churn the milk or the cream, all you have is butter. Okay. <laughs> this is a very important metaphor for my message here. Because my message is, you're not, tra you're not suppressing, which doesn't get rid of it, right? It just kind of keeps it down, later explodes. You're not suppressing. Transforming means you're really changing it. So it's going from anger, rage or anger, and it's actually being transformed into patience or eventually love, compassion, okay? So there's no residual anger when you've done your job thoroughly. We can talk about butter later. <laughs> Anybody jealous? Anybody not jealous? Anybody never get jealous? Raise your hands if you never get jealous. We all get jealous. It's part of being human, okay? Um, let me actually make a comment here. Yeah. Um, anger, to transform anger, once we're full-blown like this slide, yeah, we can't do anything. Maybe tell yourself next time, okay? But once you're in the full, you know, you're screaming, tearing your hair out, you're red in the face. You can't do much. Um, so what, what's important is to catch anger early. That's the key. So that means you have to kind of pay attention inside what's going on repeatedly. And learn the precursors, the learn what happens to you on the road to getting angry. So what are some of those things that happen early? What, they, what might they be? Heart goes quickly. Heart beating fast. Very good. Thank you. What else? Sorry? Lose your patience. Thank you. Lovely. Yes. What else? Yes, please. Eyes tend to get warm and flushed. Great. Thanks. Head, head also? Great, thanks. What else? Excuse me? Emotion. emotion. You feel emotional? Good, thank you. Yes, please. Fight or flight. Fight or flight. You feel maybe, you know, I got to be right in there or I got to get out of here. Okay, good. What else? Please. Okay, if it kind of goes long term, it may be a feeling of resentment. Very good, thank you. Yes, please. Anything else? Must be 6.30, okay. Thank you for coming, see you again. <laughs> I understand it's not a protest. <laughs> Anybody else? I'm sorry? Sleep. Sleeplessness, yeah, you don't get to sleep, good. What else? Tension, you may feel tension, exactly. What else? Yes, please. Uh-huh. You may say or do things you may regret. Exactly. Yeah. Um, please. Okay. So we feel we're kind of righteous, the other person's wrong. Okay, good. Yes, please. Tightness in the chest. Very good. Thank you. Yes, please. Hard time breathing, great, thank you. What else do you feel before you get full-blown anger? I think you hit a lot of the big ones. You know, there was mention of not feeling, you know, lot losing patience, so also irritability or frustration or fear. Okay, we talked a little earlier, we mentioned a little bit about fear. Fear and anger often go together. So if you feel that you're getting, you, you feel fear developing, think, oh, maybe I'm getting angry or irritation or frustration. Good. So it's important to examine in you what of those things or other things that you feel before your full, fully, you know, your fully uh, full-blown anger. And then in the future, when you start feeling those things, flushed, heart going fast, trouble breathing, uh, lack of patience, uh, not sleeping well, all those things, okay? When you start feeling that, then tell yourself, oh, maybe I'm getting angry. Looks like I might be getting angry, okay? 
And then there are a couple different methods. One that I use a lot. I don't use it so much anymore because I, I don't get angry so much anymore. I still do sometimes, but it's not usually that dramatic and not very often, but it still happens. But before, when I was a little younger and working on this, I used this technique a lot, and, and it really, for me, has worked. I think right away, the other, if I'm getting angry with another person, sometimes we get angry with ourselves. If I'm getting angry with another person, think that other person is not happy. Why? People that provoke are not happy. And anger, it's a dance. It takes two people, right? Both involved. So I think right away that other person's not happy. And then I think, well, why not? Why are, you know, usually I don't know. So I think of what are the, some of the biggies, why people are not happy. What makes you unhappy? Never get unhappy? <laughs> Excuse me? Discomfort. Discomfort, thank you. So I think maybe the other person's in discomfort. Good. What else? Disappointment. Disappointment? Exactly. So the other person may have just suffered some kind of disappointment. Good. What else? Powerless. So the person's feeling po powerless. Good. What else? They're depressed. So they may be going through or feeling depressed. Good. What else? Makes you unhappy. Excuse me? The person could have had just some fight or something, get, I had been mad with someone else, exactly. So I put that in the category of relationship stuff, right? Nobody here has relationship problems, I'm sure. We all do, yeah, all do. That's just part of being in life. You don't even have to be living with someone or going with someone or married to someone or in a relationship, but we have all kinds of, you know, relationships. And sometimes, uh, you know, it just doesn't go so well bad word or bad feelings or disagreement, whatever. What else? Resentment, good. Okay, so the other person is feeling from some other situation resentment, good. What else? Not being heard. So the other first person had just maybe come from some situation and felt like they weren't being heard, good. What else? Very good. So they're just ready to lash out regardless of who walks in front of them. Good, good, good. None of you guys have financial problems, huh? <laughs> they feel they don't have enough money or, you know, worry about their job or don't have a job or, you know, financial issues. What else? You guys aren't old enough yet. Please. Hungry, dehydrated, not enough sleep. Good. So the other person's hungry and or dehydrated and or didn't get enough sleep. Good. Even though the other person may not be a teenager. But good. What about health issues? You know, they woke up the last three days and had some pain in their back. And, you know, they're worried that, oh, I've got to get another surgery. Oh, no, I can't stand that. Right? Some health issue. They went to the doctor, and the doctor said, yeah, everything looks good on your tests, but come on back. I want to check you again next week. Oh, why? <laughs> yeah. So health issues, economic issues, emotional issues. A lot of the things we talked about are emo emotional issues and financial issues. So I just kind of go through that. I think that. Maybe the other person's not happy because this, this, and this. OK, that takes me less than a minute, usually. I never looked at the watch, but you know, it might be half a minute or something, just to think that way. So what happens to this early anger that was developing? What happens to it? All right? Turns into compassion. It can, exactly. Won't do it on the first time, guaranteed. <laughs> but if we're persistent, yes, it can turn into compassion, yes. And what happens, you know, as we ignore, okay, because we're thinking about the other person's situation, why they're unhappy. So we're ignoring this early anger. And this early anger likes the spotlight, likes the attention, okay? And we're not paying it attention. 
It's kind of narcissistic, yeah. And when it doesn't get the attention, what does it do? Right? Escalate. Might escalate. That's one, that's one thing it might do, but we're not paying it attention. We're not fueling the fire. Very likely it's going to go away, dissipate, because we're not giving it the spotlight for it to grow. Okay? And that's actually what does happen. Once you do this over and over again, you'll begin to find that that early anger just kind of died on the vine. Okay. Just wanted to mention that as one approach to working with the anger. The key, again, is finding it, recognizing it early. And then this approach I just mentioned, you know, think the other person is not happy. Why? Da, 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 da. And by that time, this early anger is just kind of disappeared. Okay. Doesn't happen the first time. Okay, you heard me say that. Okay. Nobody gets jealous? I think we all do, yeah. And often we don't recognize it. You know, that's the thing about jealousy is often it's subliminal. It's under the radar. So that means we have to kind of pay attention. You know, what's happening inside? Is there some jealousy going on? Because when we do get jealous, even if we don't notice that it affects us, we tend to be more closed, not quite as happy, maybe a little out of balance, or a little more out of balance. So do you remember those, uh, you know, in the old days when you used to go to a drive-in movie? I think they still have a few of them around. And what they used to do before the movie would start, they would flash, you know, less than two or 100 milliseconds by a Coke. And you, you didn't register. You didn't, if people said what was on the screen, you would say nothing is blank. But everybody opened their car door and ran over to the concession booth, got in line and bought a Coke. Okay. So subliminal. So to look and see what's under the radar, what's inside, because it does affect us. We may not buy a Coke, but it affects us. So, subliminal, once we recognize jealousy, it's not hard to replace it. And what are we going to replace it with? What's the opposite of jealousy? Please. Gratitude. Yeah, gratitude, appreciation. Sometimes the word um, is rejoicing, feeling happy, basically. Exactly. So we have the choice. Okay, I think, did I? Yeah, so it's not so difficult. Whoops, sorry. Uh, so I'll tell you a story. Um, um, I have to change the story just a little bit. <laughs> so somebody hears this uh, <clears throat> lovely purring engine stop in front of their house. They open the blind and they see this incredibly beautiful turquoise uh, Maserati with a with the top down. Okay. And immediately they slam the blind shut. They say, oh, she doesn't deserve it. I do. I've been saving up. I've been taking driving lessons and I've wanted a Maserati since I was a kid. Goes has dinner, can't eat. No appetite. Later on, gets indigestion, goes to bed, can't sleep. Okay? Scenario number two. Same engine, purring engine comes, stops. And the neighbor on the other side opens the blinds and immediately smiles and says to himself, wow, my neighbor is so lucky. I'm so happy for her. What a gorgeous car. I'm going to go over and I'm going to, you know, kind of congratulate her. So he walks over and she says, oh, yes, come in. He says, wow, I'm so happy for you. Such a beautiful car. She says, well, I was just going to take it out. Do you want to join? Oh, yeah. They go out for a spin down Pacific Avenue. It's a nice day. The top is down and going slow. Everybody's watching. She pulls over, says, would you like to drive? He's besides himself with joy. And he got to drive slow down Pacific Avenue. Okay. 
goes home, sleeps well, has a good meal, digests well, sleeps well, wakes up happy. So we have the choice to be jealous, act in a jealous way, or to appreciate or have gratitude, feel happy for the other person's success, possession, whatever it may be. Okay, anybody recognize this? Arrogance is weakness, disguised as strength. Okay? We often think the opposite. We often think that arrogance, you know, people that are kind of, you know, walking around like this and talking like this, you know, like that, that they're strong and they're, it's kind of a, almost a value in our, in our culture. But actually, it's usually insecurity, weakness, disguised as strength. Okay? It's kind of a mask. Einstein, again, I'd like to quote, said, the only thing more dangerous than, it, than ignorance is arrogance. Arrogance is, is a trap. It's like a prison. It's a very lonely place. We lose our good friends. Once you get stuck there, very difficult to get out, thinking you're the best, you know it all, you're the most beautiful, whatever. Okay? So if you find yourself moving in that direction, big red flag, you don't want to go to prison, you don't want to lose your good friends, you know, try to work on reducing your ego. Very, very important. What do you do when you've freed yourself of all desire? Accept the desire to be free from desire. <laughs> so we talk about two types of desire, a healthy one and one that's not so healthy. Okay? The healthy one is the one that you know, helps us, inspires us to be a better person, to do better in relationships, to do better in our work, to do better in, in terms of personal development, develop more honesty and integrity and compassion, less anger, less ego, less greed, less selfishness. Okay? That's considered to be a good, healthy desire. Okay? The desire for the second Maserati, not so healthy. Okay? Eventually, even the desire to you know, purify, become a better person, even that desire will let go, eventually, as we go much further along in our practice. But for probably all of us, including myself, you know, at this level of our development, that desire to become a better person, okay, better citizen, um, better in relationship with others, you know, happier, um, more honest, trustworthy, um, that's a good kind of desire, healthy. Sometimes we fall into criticism. We criticize ourselves. We doubt ourselves, put ourselves down. And that same kind of thing, sometimes it goes outward. We put others down. We may verbalize it. We may not. OK? This is kind of a downward spiral. It's not healthy. It can lead to cynicism, where everything has this kind of negative kind of shadow over it. OK? If we find ourselves going in those directions, and we do sometimes, you know, try to remember about others. It's a kind of simple truism. Too much you know, self-preoccupation can make us spiral down, often into being self-critical and criticizing others and becoming cynical. So if we can reach out, even, even in our thoughts, you know, for concern for the welfare of others, and if we can do something, even something that seems very little, maybe inconsequential, it's not. Someone's a little lost, you know, can I help you or are you lost? Or someone that's coming through a door in a wheelchair and they're a little stuck, can I help you maneuver to get in properly? You know, things that may seem like not big deals, they're important. They're important for the person that you're helping, they're also important for you. Because the more you can get away with it, away from this self-preoccupation, me, 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 the happier you actually are, and the more you can help and help other people be happy, comfortable. Okay. 
We'll come back to that. Um, this is a lake in Tibet. And I'm not certain, but I think it's a lake called Lama Latso. Lama Latso. Latso is a lake, and Lamo or Lama Lamo is like a deity, a god, kind of a god, isn't really quite the word, like a celestial, some special being, special being. So this is a very interesting lake, and I think this is Lama Latso. Um, it's prophetic sometimes. Some people that go there, when it's calm and flat, like in this photo, they can see things on the future. Uh, they can see things on the surface of the lake that portend the future. So for example, when the 13th Dalai Lama passed away in 1933, probably about a year later, maybe 1934, a search party started looking for the reincarnation, the new 14th Dalai Lama. They did many, many things, and that could be a whole lecture in itself. But one of the things they did was they went to Lama Lhotse. And several in the search party saw clearly on the surface of the still lake, Lama Lhotse, Aka Ma, Tibetan letters, which meant that the new Dalai Lama would be born in the far east of Tibet, which means Amdo, and also that the house would have a turquoise tile roof. And indeed, when the 14th, the current Dalai Lama, who is now 81, when he was a tiny little kid, maybe one, two years old, was found um, to be the reincarnation, uh, he, was in, he was in Amdo, the far east of, uh, of Tibet. And his family house indeed had a turquoise tile roof. So I threw this in here, not to tell you so much history about the Dalai Lama or Tibet, but just that it relaxes us. Nature just kind of, you know, we kind of go, oh. I did it for that reason. Pooh says to Piglet, what day is it? Piglet says, it's today. Pooh says, oh, that's my favorite day. <laughs> kind of meaning the present. Yeah, today, not yesterday, not tomorrow, today, the present. So turning inward to check up, to see what's happening inside, thoughts, feelings, emotions, bodily sensations. This is an important thing to begin to try to do and then do it regularly, to find out what's happening in that inner world. because. Even, even when we're not aware of it, it still has a major impact. It affects us greatly. Okay? So it's important if we need to and want to and need to write the course, if we're falling into negative stuff, we've got to know, what, we've got to know what's happening. Okay? So turning inward. Some people say to me, I don't know how to do that. You know, um, I guess I've been doing it for so long that it seems so evident. So just try. Just try to you know, kind of be a little quiet. Try not to be going outward so much and just, you know, what am I thinking right now? What am I feeling? How does the body feel? Sensations? What's my mood? Do that again and again and you'll start to make contact. It's not so difficult. Practice it, please. Okay, a few words about meditation. It's happening in the schools now, you know, all over. Jay was just telling me it's happening right here in Tacoma in some of the schools. Some of the teachers have learned mindfulness and they're beginning from the lower grades, I think even kindergarten, lower grades anyway, to bring in positive education, compassion education, and mindfulness and meditation. And this is such a classroom, I don't think it's Tacoma. It's happening all around the world, actually. It's become very popular in Mexico. It's become very popular in some European countries, Canada, uh, and some countries further east. So it's, it's, it's a movement that's really like wildfire catching on. So what is meditation? So training our mind to be healthy, okay? It's a training. It's just like training our bodies in one sense. It's just like training our bodies. You need to do it again and again. You know, how are you gonna become a good tennis player? I play tennis, but I'm not very good. But if I wanted to be good, I'd have to play, play and practice pretty much every day 
for a few hours, take a few lessons, have somebody you know, look and see how I'm serving in my backhand, which has been terrible up until earlier this year when I happened to play with somebody who was an ex-pro and a teacher. And he said, you know, do this, 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 and your backhand will be good. And I did it a couple times, and wham, it was great. It felt wonderful. <laughs> training, OK? Same thing with training our minds. You know, you got to do it regularly, OK? You have to learn what, what kind of training. And once you learn some of those things, start doing it and do it regularly. You know? I tell people, and we'll do a meditation in just a little while, uh, you know, to, to do it every morning. Even just five minutes, 10 minutes is great. But do it regularly. Like brushing your teeth, you know, make it a habit. Okay. So training our mind to be healthy. Cultivating stability and clarity. These are technical terms. Stability is the opposite of distraction. Okay. Normally our minds are going foom, 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 right? Getting distracted. So stability is boom, like a laser. Staying right on the object, not getting distracted. Clarity is when the mind brightens. So it's kind of a little bit like those aha moments. You know, you're playing the guitar and you're trying to get that riff and it just doesn't work, doesn't work, doesn't work. And all of a sudden you get it. It's like, oh, wow. Kind of mind becomes clear at that moment. Okay. Or you're making a painting and you've gone over it, you know, umpteen times with your, with your uh, oils. And finally, oh, wow, that's it. Like, aha, mind gets clear. A little bit like that. And absorbing the, our mind with the object. So they kind of become one. Okay? And you know that experience. Those of you that sing, play musical instruments, or listen to music. When you're kind of in the groove and you're really enjoying it, it's like for those moments or longer, you're not aware of yourself. And you're not even quite aware of the music. You just kind of be, become the music. Kind of like that. You get absorbed in it. And if you look at your watch, it's like, oh, wow, an hour went by? I thought it was just five, 10 minutes. Okay? And the opposite, you know, when you're doing something to grind, you have to do it, right? You're plugging away and you're pushing, da, da, da. you don't like it. You look at your watch and only five minutes? <laughs> right? So the perception of time is very fast when you're absorbed in something, and when you're you know, having trouble with something, the perception is that it goes very slow. Okay. So these are some of the qualities that, of meditation. There's uh, two types of meditation. One where you concentrate like a laser. That's what we're going to do shortly after our Q&A, which is coming up fairly soon. Um, and the other is contemplative, contemplating, thinking, analyzing. So you pick a topic, you know, and I'll mention that in just a moment. So here, this is for concentration. You can choose an object, which would be your breath, and that's what we're going to do. You could choose a mental image, a mental image. If you're Buddhist, it would be Buddha. If you're Islamic, it might be Muhammad. If you're Christian, it might be Jesus. Um, if you really love Albert Einstein the way I do, it might be Albert Einstein. You know, an inspirational figure, OK? Or the mind itself, okay, and that's a little tougher one. That's when you're not in, everything's open, wide open. Your senses, your mind, everything, wide open, but you're not grasping at anything. So if a thought comes, it comes, it goes. You don't grab it, you don't follow it, you don't engage it. If a sound, you hear a sound, it comes and you leave it, you just let, let it be. Okay. So it's non-grasping or non-referential. So this is what they do in Zen, Zazen, you know, Zen meditation. This is what they do in Dzogchen and Mahamudra in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition. It's kind of a mind meditation. What we're really doing is we're concentrating without grasping the essence of the mind, which is awareness. It's being alive, being aware. OK, I don't know if I want to go into this. There's a lot of stuff. This is how we cultivate fully that concentration meditation, sometimes called shamatha in Sanskrit. So there are actually nine stages here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay? And each of them is 
a level of mental development, starting with total distraction. The mind, you know, we're supposed to be following our breath and our mind is going to, I didn't have dinner, what do I got in the fridge? Oh, what do I have to do afterwards? Oh, I gotta make a phone call to somebody, I forgot all about that, you know, all that stuff. Okay, that's the first stage. Second stage with a little bit of whiteness on the monkey and the elephant is we're kind of half-half. Half of the time we're on our object, in this case, say the breath, for example, and half the time we're, you know, think about anything else. Okay. By the third stage, we're a little bit more purified. One, two, three, the monkey and the elephant. So more of the time we're on the object, less of the time we're distracted. And by the fourth stage, we're totally on the object, but sometimes we're clever. The ego, the mind is very clever. We can multitask with part of the mind, but still stay on the object. Okay, that we do. Okay, you may know that. I mean, from your own experience. By the fifth stage, okay, we're totally on the object, no multitasking. Okay, that's the fifth stage. By the sixth stage, we're beginning to develop this clarity of mind. Not of the object, but of the mind. It starts to shine, like the examples I gave before, the aha moments, a little bit similar. And by the seventh stage, our clarity is pretty much complete. Okay? And then by the eighth stage, here, uh, we have fully developed the stability and clarity, but it takes effort. We have to make sure that we're not getting away from stability, away from clarity. It takes a little bit of effort to maintain that. By the ninth stage, I guess this is the ninth stage, uh, no longer is effort required. Sit on your cushion or wherever you are to do your meditation, have an intention to do your meditation, it just goes on its own. It's a little bit like riding your bike and taking, you know, as a kid, taking your hands off the handlebars and kind of saying, look, Ma, no hands. You kind of ride with, I mean, this effort, but not much, okay? And then there's something called the pliancies up here. That's working, keep, keep, continue your meditation. And then some of the energies inside the body in the, in the channel start to smooth out. And so you become tremendously, there's tremendous joy. You feel light as a feather. You feel like you could fly. And the five clairvoyances are developed where you can see and hear at long distances clearly, read other people's minds, no past, no future, those five clairvoyances. That comes naturally. Okay, enough of that. And then the second type of meditation is contemplative. You might pick topics such as suffering, your own suffering, to therefore get in touch with others' suffering, because we all have similar sufferings, okay? Yeah, you might have compassion as a topic that you're kind of thinking about, or you might have change or impermanence, or the Buddhist wisdom of emptiness, like, you know, it's very similar to quantum physics, that nothing is so solid and, and uh, independent, that everything's kind of in a nexus in relationship. Okay, so this was, uh, I guess it was me. That's a good question. I don't know if it was, I have to say it was in my mental, con my mental continuum, because that body is not the same as the one you see now. The one you see now is old and wrinkled, and that was kind of a younger guy. It wasn't that many years ago, actually. So this is a study that was done in the University of, Was of, of Wisconsin-Madison, where they um, Richard Davidson et al. took a group of about 11, 12 long-term meditators and investigated their brains to see if they're the same or different from people that don't do regular meditation. And so first they put us in that MRI, the, and they did functional MRI, so they're actually looking also at the blood flow. And so uh, what they found was this prefrontal cortex, which you see in yellow, which is a huge part of the cortex of the brain, um, was bigger anatomically and functionally it was more active in long-term meditators compared to others that don't make regularly meditate. Okay, now what's the importance of that? The PFC, the prefrontal cortex, that area we just looked at, controls the highest levels of thinking. It has the term, it's often called the executive network or the executive control center. Okay? And the things that it kind of 
executes or it kind of uh, does are planning, reasoning, imagination, creativity, not an identity of who we are, but some sense of who we are, of ourself, pro-social behavior, and compassion. Now, these, some of the, these things happen in other parts of the brain, but this is a primary center for these activities. So it's higher, so-called higher function, executive function. And this seems to be working better, and this area is bigger in long-term meditators. Then they put us in the electro, under uh, uh, EEG, electroencephalography. Um, and what they found were these, gamma waves. Okay? Now, gamma waves are high amplitude. They're big on the graph. I mean, you know, big, long on the graph. And they're short, okay? high frequency. So they, they, they're short. Okay? These were bursts. And you can see that they happened in many, many different leads all across the cortex. So at first, the scientists, the neuroscientists uh, at Ma University of Wisconsin-Madison, they were thinking, wow, these meditators are having convulsions. Well, they had video, and they could see us and everything. They weren't tonic-clonic. They weren't movement type of seizures. There are temporal lobe seizures where you don't really move. They investigated this. They were not having temporal lobe epilepsy. Okay, then they thought, this must be some mu muscle artifact in the scalp, in the jaw, in the face. And they did a lot of work to factor this out. It was not easy, but they did with a lot of other experts. Um, and they've, they've ruled out that this is muscle artifact. So they're left with, it's a real finding, it's in the cortex, what is it? What they think it is is synchronicity. So let me show you a couple things here. This high amplitude, the gamma waves, okay, these very big on the graph, uh, oscillations, uh, are the size of the brain waves. Okay, so these are big brain waves that reflects the number of neural populations. So the number of cells, the number of neurons in the brain that are firing synchronously. So that's quite amazing. Now, you know, if I talk to doctors about this, particularly the neurologists, that's not what we learned in medical school. We learned that maybe there can be some communication a millimeter or less in the cortex between neurocells. So this is something novel, something quite new. So then the, so I have one more. So this synchronicity of oscillations reflects the large scale, large scale coordination of brain cells, neurons, okay? The alpha slow waves, the alpha waves, and these fast gamma waves, they're also in synchrony when the long-term meditators are meditating. When they're not, you don't find this gamma wave activity, you don't find this synchronicity. So it's only during the meditation. And what the experience of the expert meditators, long-term meditators, is precisely that, a feeling everything is in sync. Everything is coordinated, orchestrated. Everything is kind of OK. This is still not finished. The neuroscientists are still trying to figure out what this means. Um, they all seem to be converging over the last almost 10 years on synchronicity and exactly what that is and the details still working out. So we're shifting our focus away from me, 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 from I, 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 and iPhone. On a deeper level, we're all the same. All of us want to be happy, none of us wants to hurt. Even animals, even little animals, when you kind of, if you play with ants or something, if you disturb them, they get upset. If you feed them a little sugar, a little water, you're really gentle, or really calm, they seem calm. Okay. So even small insects, we all want to be happy, none of us wants to hurt. And we tend to forget this, so I like to suggest this can be like a mantra, something you can remember again and again and again. And the more we remember this, it changes our relationships with others. We automatically start feeling closer. So I tell people to be careful. 
Next time you go to the airport, you may start hugging everybody. And then the airport security will take you away, <laughs> put you in jail. <laughs> Trust is something that develops with this same kind of feeling closer. Concern for others, the fruit of faith. And I would say it could be faith in God, it could be faith in our own potential, is love. And the fruit of love is service. Saint Mother Teresa. Compassion, can you see that? Yeah. I call this compassionate wisdom. This uh, was in uh, 2011 in a small town in the northeast of Japan called Ishinomaki. Ishinomaki, not too far from Sendai. It's in the northeast. It's where on March 11th of that year, 2011, the uh, massive earthquake, something like a nine or nine something on the Richter scale. They measure it a little differently, but similar. And the huge tsunamis hit that whole northeast section of, uh, of Japan. And that's when you know, the Fukushima reactors of the five, they were knocked out. And they're still trying to clean that up and work with that. It's a tremendous, tremendous tragedy. There was a tremendous loss of life. And in this town, Ishinomaki, uh, there was a school um, where the uh, principal and the teachers, they made a quick decision, turned out not to be a good one. They brought all the kids into a building that was separate from the school, but still on low ground, and they all were drowned. So this is a child who actually lost both of his parents, became orphaned, completely orphaned, from that tsunami. And His Holiness was visiting. I was with him. This was, I think, in, uh, it was later that year, later in that year, 2011. And uh, found out about this boy and what had happened to him. And so he spent quite a bit of time kind of there just hugging and being close. Okay, two things I want to, three things I want to mention. If you're on Facebook, come and see me, Barry Curzon. It's not chatting. It's a public figure site. And so it's educational. Every second or third day I put out a post which has a lot to do with the things we're talking about tonight and some other things. So if you like it, if you go there and you like it, like the home page and you'll get the post automatically. Uh, this is the group Altruism in Medicine Institute, altruismmedicine.org, um, which we set up three years ago. It's a nonprofit to bring more compassion into healthcare. And this is a group that was set up over 30 years ago mindandlife.org uh, with the Dalai Lama and scientists. And usually several times a year they have these uh, dialogues, usually Buddhist uh, philosophy or psychology. And these are with quantum physicists, with neurobiologists, brain scientists, um, psychologists, doctors, cosmologists about the Big Bang Theory, you know, the formation of the universe. Um, and, and they have a very nice website there. Good. So we have about, uh, you know, if we stop at 7.30, we have just about a half hour. So if you have some questions or comments, I would invite you to please come to the microphones on the side and, um, and uh, go ahead, please. Don't feel embarrassed. Please don't feel hesitant. Um, I, I'm not a hard guy on these. I'm very inviting. Okay, please. Oops, 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 Please. Good evening. Thank you. My name is Anna Salyer, and I'm one of the librarians here. Lovely. So welcome on behalf of all of us. Yeah. And I was wondering, when you were having the MRI, did you meditate? Yes. Um, when we were in the MRI, there were four instructions that came to us. So we had headphones. We also had a little... Uh, speaker thing, you know, what do you call this, a mic. So we could talk to them if we needed, but primarily we listened to their instructions. So there were four different instructions that came at different times. There were three meditations. One was a shamatha, like we're going to do shortly, where we concentrated on the breath or anything we chose, 
the mind or anything. And then second was um, uh, a, they called it an open presence kind of meditation where the mind was wide open. It wasn't grasping or clinging to anything. We, that was the second meditation. And the third meditation was that one with compassion to try to juice, bring compassion into that meditation, try to feel it. And the fourth instruction was don't meditate. But most of the time we were meditating, but they wanted to also get some measurements when we were not meditating. And sometimes that went on for a couple hours. Oh, that was my next question. How long was that? Sometimes, uh, you know, an hour to two, even a little longer sometimes. Um, so you did it more than once? Uh, we were in the scanner right. more than once. And we were invited back uh, several times, so it was a long-term study, yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. I thought you guys are going to have all these questions. This is not really a question. It's sort of an affirmation. So my name is Grace, and I taught mindfulness. I went away and got trained in mindful schools, taught mindfulness in the uh, schools for elementary kids a couple of times. Uh, it took a couple of years. And uh, before that, I had a meditation um, habit, and, uh, but I guess it wasn't as good as it could have been. And uh, when I started teaching, I really emphasized the breathing and everything. and. Uh, went through the whole program with them over and over. And before I started that, I had high blood pressure. Not extremely high, but the doctor said, well, you should take some medication. Well, I didn't really want to take medication. And so I did a little bit, and then I'd kind of go off, but then I would worry, I'd check my blood pressure. But after teaching mindfulness to the kids, I had no blood pressure problems. My, he, when I went to the doctor, he says, wow, your blood pressure is great. It's just like a kid, you know, so it was really so funny. And so after that, if I, I would kind of have a feeling of tension or something like that, I would just do my breathing mindfulness. And we practiced a lot of um, kindness, loving kindness. And one year, the, um, one of the teachers, uh, one of the playground people said, we did first the fourth grade just as a test. And she came in and said, Wow, what is it with the fourth grade? They're just doing so great on the playground. So we were like, yes. <laughs> but it was a wonderful experience. And last year, I just did the kindergarten just for free. We got a grant before, but I did it because I love it so much. And to see those little kids, how that they take to it, it's, it's wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you. And all the money you save not having to buy blood pressure medicine and all the side effects that you save not having to take those too. Wonderful. Please. Hi, Barry. Um, um, how did you, um, see, I got so many questions, but um, how, how long do you meditate and how many times a day and is it the same every day or, or do you sometimes forget to pray? <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, I, I meditate twice a day, morning and evening, a total of about two hours, sometimes longer. Um, and I pretty much go through the same things every day. And it's a variety of this concentration meditation and also that contemplative meditation. Um, it's a lot of imagination of things. Um, it, and, and also it involves the compassion, the love and compassion. And it also involves the insight or the wisdom into who we are deeply and what the world is more deeply, yes. I've been doing it for a long time. You know, I, I've been doing it for, some of it for 30, over 30 years, something, yeah. Please. Thank you for your talk. Uh, my name's Charlie, I, I teach social work here. And for a lot of our students, and I think uh, uh, also practitioners of social work, nursing, medicine, there comes a point where we might experience what is sometimes called compassion fatigue. Mm -hmm. So yeah. dukkha, dukkha, over and over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if maybe you have some thoughts about how uh, folks who are steeped in the suffering of others mm -hmm. might manage to uh, 
find their own balance and not lose that. Oh, good. Thank you, Charlie. Very important, because many of us do service kind of oriented work. Regardless of what we do, there's often an aspect, more or less, an aspect of service. And if we're around people that are having a hard time, so social workers, psychologists, often doctors, nurses, you know, we're around people that are often sick. They're not well, physically, emotionally, spiritually. And uh, if we are very plugged into their suffering, which is, you know, a good thing, because we're more sensitive and we can, you know, kind of react in a positive way, try to help them be loving, compassionate. If we do this day in and day out, and we don't know how to clear that pain, then it builds up. And then we're on the road or are burning out. Um, and so I like to make the distinction, uh, I do make the distinction, between empathy and compassion. So empathy is feeling like the other person's feeling, kind of being in the other person's shoes. And if we're taking on that suffering all the time, and we don't know how to clear it, we're going to burn out. It's going to be overwhelming. So what, I, what we teach, and I try to do myself is, as a physician, as a monastic, um, is to shift from empathy to compassion. Compassion is not the same as empathy. Compassion is the wish and the actual engagement, doing something, the activity of relieving suffering. And the overall feeling tone of compassion is positive, often joyous, because you're helping somebody. And the more you do that, it becomes a little bit less dependent on outcome. So regardless, I mean, you do your best. And regardless of outcome, you still feel good about helping. Now, of course, it'll be tinged. Those are His Holiness the Dalai Lama's words, tinged with sadness, because you're touching the other person's pain, but not overwhelmed and adopting all of that pain. So that's the difference. And how do you practice that? How do you get there? You know, um, you know, you, you, first you recognize the difference between empathy and compassion. And then you try to, you know, you a little bit back away so you're not on top of the suffering. Okay? You're still feeling it, you're still open, but you're not, you know, kind of embracing it. You've backed up a little bit emotionally, you've backed up a little bit. Okay? And it actually gives you more clarity and more perspective to make better decisions in terms of the skillful acts aspect of practicing or engaging in compassion. So, and then as we mature more in our practice of compassion, we less and less require or need uh, something in return. You know, initially we kind of need, you know, a thank you, a smile, something. You know, in relationships, often it's all of you if you love me. We need that something in return. But the more we concentrate on that commonality of we all want to be happy and not hurt, and we start acting more and more from that perspective, and we, only, we do it solely because we know they're like me, they only want to be happy, they don't want to hurt. And, and thus, less and less do we need to have in return. And eventually, we don't need anything in return. And that's a good feeling, living our lives that way. It's a very meaningful, rich feeling. Thank you. Great. So should we meditate? OK, let's meditate. Um, how many of you have meditated before? Please raise your hands. Wow, just about everybody. OK, fantastic. How many have a regular daily meditation? Raise your hands. A lot of you. Wow, fantastic. Good. So maybe you come up and teach this, and I'll go sit down. <laughs> um, OK, since we have a lot of experienced people, not everybody. I know some of you haven't. And some of you haven't meditated. And some of you don't have a regular daily practice. But many of you do. I'd like to do a meditation on the mind with you. OK? So what we're going to do on this one is nothing. Just do nothing. Do you know how to do nothing? Often it's not as easy as it sounds, because we're so, so used to doing something. Okay. 
We're just going to let go. Okay, that's the key. Just let go. Okay, we're going to leave our eyes open, and we're going to keep our back straight, and we're going to keep our heads up, and we're going to look a little bit above the horizon. So for you guys, it's probably going to be somewhere up on the screen. Maybe I can turn this off. Uh, Mark or someone, can we turn this? Can I turn this off? Oh, great. Thank you very much. Super. Then people won't have to read stuff. Thank you very much. That's great. Yeah, that's perfect. Good. So you'll probably be looking kind of the screen, you know, 15, 20, 20 degrees above the horizon. You're not going to be looking way up there, but just a little bit up. Okay. And try not to, everything will be wide open. Okay. Your eyes, your ears, all your senses, your mind. So thoughts may come. The trick is don't grasp at anything. Okay. So if you see kind of a screen in front of you, don't grasp it. Don't stare at it. Just let it be. You have a thought that comes up, let it come up, let it go. Don't grab it, don't engage it, don't follow it. You hear a sound, let the sound come, let the sound go. Don't engage, don't grasp, don't hold it. Just let it be. That's what I mean by doing nothing. Okay? Now, meditation, like everything in life, is a balance between being alert and being relaxed. If you're too relaxed, what happens? Right. <laughs> and if you're too alert, what happens? Monkey mind. <laughs> Jumping, yeah. Someone once told me that was disparaging to monkeys. <laughs> wasn't, wasn't meant to be. I just remember that. Someone a long time ago said, oh, you're putting monkeys down. <laughs> it just means that the mind is jumping around, and monkeys often jump around. That's a, yep. if, we're, if we're too tight, if we're too alert. So to try to balance. Now, that won't happen in one sitting, but just to kind of remember that as we go along in our practice every day, to balance alert and relaxed, OK? OK, so um, have your hands on your knees. Just relax them. And you can have them on the knees, above, you know, on your thighs, or below if you have long arms or something, whatever's comfortable, OK, with your back straight. Uh, and I'm going to guide you a little bit. I'm going to sit and meditate with you, uh, and I'll make a few comments as we go along. Uh, the metaphor for this meditation is a, a glass of water that's filled with dirt. What do you do if you want to get a clean glass of water? OK, there's a lot of ways. I shouldn't ask you. You're going to tell me different ways. But you just take the glass of water and just put it down on the table. Leave it be. Don't touch it. Gravity will settle the dirt to the bottom. And what will you be left with? Crystal clear water. Our minds are the same way. Leave it be. Things will settle. Okay. That's basically it. Anybody have a question about the technique? Remember, eyes open, looking slightly above the horizon, hands on your knees. Um, and try not to engage. Please don't stare at whatever you see. If you hear a sound, a thought, a feeling, a sensation, the body comes up, just leave it. Try not to grasp or follow it. Okay, That's what we're going to do for about 10 minutes. I'll be the timekeeper, and uh, I will meditate with you. Please meditate. I'm going to sit in the front row so you won't be looking at me. Don't worry. Uh, please meditate. Please stop your meditation. How was it? How many people kind of felt like they got into that a little bit? Raise your hands. Well, usually it's a small, maybe 20%-ish. Depends on the group. But how many people had a lot of, were struggling with it? Okay, good, thank you. Anybody kind of fall asleep or about to fall asleep? Raise your hand. Yeah, it's late in the day and we've worked hard and it's easy to kind of, you know, when you sit and do nothing, it's easy to kind of fall asleep. Anybody have the mind just jumping around too much? Kind of monkey mind stuff? Yeah, we have that. We have that much of the day usually with our stressful lives and busy lives. Good. 
Good. I just wanted to give you a taste of this meditation. Um, in some of my other talks, we'll be doing other meditations, such as the breath meditation, um, and maybe other ones. But I just wanted to give you a taste of this one. So this is sometimes called nature of the mind meditation, or just mind meditation. Yes, please. Yeah, we usually do in a lot of the traditions where I come from, keep the mouth a little bit open. So you don't have to breathe just through your nose. You usually end up breathing, you breathe naturally, and you usually end up breathing both. If your mouth is a little open, you breathe through your mouth and your nose. Please. Sure. So we have a number of, you know, I'm here for the month of October and working at UWT. And also I'm invited by the uh, SIAS, the School for Interdisciplinary Arts and Sciences. What's the last S? Oh, Sciences, good. Um, and so you can go to the UWT website and you can find some of the public programs I'm doing, such as the one tonight, or semi-public. Um, also, you can go to our Altruism in Medicine website. Could we get that uh, uh, slide back on? Would you mind? I didn't see how you did it. Thank you very much. I'll show you that URL again. Oh, it's on. Whoa, whoa, whoa. We've got, we've got help from above. <laughs> uh, the center one, this one, altruismmedicine.org. And on our homepage, uh, all of our events uh, are listed there. You can go there. Um, we're also putting up, I think in the process, or maybe they're already put up, I'm doing some talks over uh, at uh, TG, at Tacoma General Multicare. So you're welcome to some of those big talks that are open to the public also. Um, did I cover that? Good, good, good. Any last questions? And yes, please. Um, there'll be varieties of the same theme. Um, I, you know, sometimes I talk about death and dying. Sometimes I talk about the subtle body and the subtle mind. I, I, I haven't quite been asked to talk about those, but I've been thinking of weaving some of that material into some of our public lectures, so I'll vary it a bit. Yeah, yeah, please. I noticed that they're, being, they're filming this. Um, yes. Yeah, it, it'll be in your major theaters across the country. And <laughs> <laughs> uh, joking. Uh, I think they're going to put them up on the UW, UWT website. Is that correct? I believe so. Um, if you can't find them and you want to find them, uh, you can contact somebody in the SIAS office, Interdisciplinary Studies office uh, here at UWT, and they can direct you, but my understanding is that it'll be up on the UWT website. And probably, I uh, can't promise this, but very likely, we'll also put them up here. That's what our goal is, to put them also, because a lot of my teachings end up going there. Some of them end up on YouTube, you may have seen, but you'll see a lot of YouTubes of things I've taught at different places over different countries. So those are places to look. Yep. Good. Well, thank you very much. Uh, there's a the last slide. There we go. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>